Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. Happy New Year. Go ahead and grab your Bible. Uh, if you didn't bring your Bible, uh, I want to encourage you to do that every week. But you'll have a black Bible there in front of you, hardback black Bible in the pew rack in front of you. You can grab that one uh, and pull it out. You can go ahead and turn to Philippians is where we're going to end up here in just a moment. I'm excited about this message the Lord's given me today. It's always good when the preacher feels like the Lord's spoken into his heart. So I'm excited about what God is going to say to us as he's spoken into my heart this week. Uh, how many were here uh, Christmas Eve? I'm curious. A lot of you are in town. Some of you maybe not. You're out of town. We had uh, right at 5,000 people here, one of the largest Christmas Eves we've ever had in the history of our church, and just an exciting time. Uh, as I've noted, just uh, really excited about the, 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 the year to come. I have a special New Year's message for all of us here, whether you're a guest, a member, uh, out of town, in town, uh, a word for all of us. And uh, I've called it one thing, a new year revolution. That's not a typo. Uh, it's a time we make resolutions for sure. I read recently, you know, kind of the top 10 uh, resolutions are often the same. People want to work out a little more. They want to eat less, drink less. That must be for the Episcopalians. Baptists don't drink, but some of them do. Some other people drink too much. And they want to drink less. They want to spend less. People want to save money. They're always the same. I saw the top 10. You know, want to volunteer some more. Uh, but then I read research that shows that uh, four out of five of us will break our resolutions. A third of us won't get out of January without breaking them. So we'll set goals. We'll be in the gym next week. And then we'll just kind of peter out and not be there much uh, anymore, but that's how it goes. So here's the problem. You see, a resolution is really a decision. It's an intention. I'm deciding I'm going to do something. But a revolution is, is, is something more. Look at this. You can see a definition there. Revolution, it's from the Latin word revolutio. It, it, it means a turnaround. A revolution is a fundamental change in power or organizational structure. We're going to be talking about internally that takes place over a relatively short period of time. A revolution is an uprising. You know that. It's a disruption. It's an upheaval. It's a mutiny or insurrection. In spiritual terms, a revolution is what we, we call transformation. It's a conversion. And that's what we need. We need a change of heart. That's exactly what I want to challenge you to today is a personal revolution. I want to encourage you, challenge you to revolt against anything is not the main thing. We're going to talk about the one thing that God's called us to. You know, in a general sense, a lot of us know that we need to prioritize our lives, right? If you're going to set your life on course, if you're going to accomplish great things, you need to prioritize things. Now, it's relatively new, though, in terms of history, etymology of language. We talk about priorities, which is a misnomer. There's only one priority, but somehow, and particularly in the global West, we talk about, well, priority number one. And then there's priority number two. And priority, by definition, means there's only one first. But a lot of us think, well, if I could prioritize my life and those things that are important to me, then I'll have a balanced life. That's really what I need. I need, to, I need more balance in my life. Listen, Jesus never talked about balance. Never. This is a concept, a truth that revolutionized my life as a young father in particular, trying to, to balance competing time demands as a pastor, as a husband, a father. And, and, and I realized Jesus did not talk about balance. He talked about the pursuit of one thing. And that's what I want to talk about today. This is life changing. It's why God brought you here this morning. Because here in Matthew six thirty three, before we get to Philippians, uh, he says this, but seek first the kingdom of God. Again, there's only one first. And his righteousness in all these things will be added to you. All these concerns, things that create anxiety, worry in our life, I could add just everything will fall into place if you pursue him first. The brilliance of this idea is that if you don't have one thing 
that you're all about, you'll be distracted by a million things. And listen, what distracts you will ultimately define you. Show me what your habits are this week, this month. I'll show you who you are becoming a year from now. And so what I want to talk about today is this concept that there's one thing that he's called us to. And, and, and I'm going to be bold today. I'm going to challenge you because many of us would claim to be Christians and we're not pursuing the main thing. And so I want you to, again, turn to Philippians chapter 3. Paul's going to give us some guidance here. We're going to focus on, you can see it there, verses 12 through 14. But I'm going to start really uh, back a little ways to place this in context. I want to talk about three things that Paul shows us here in this brief passage that are necessary for personal life revolution. That's what we're talking about, a personal life revolution. And I want want you to see these three things. Now, uh, here's where this is heading. I'm going to offer two pictures of what this looks like in life. One's from the Old Testament, one's from the New Testament. Then I'm going to give you a specific challenge in the end, all right? And uh, then we're going to go forth and we're going to apply what God's teaching us. Now, listen, my part in this is to prepare and study, to preach what God's Word is saying, seek to apply it in our lives today. Your role is to listen to the Spirit of God as He speaks to you. So you have His Word before you, and we're going to say, Lord, speak into my heart. It's why you're here. Isn't it why you got up this morning, got out in the cold, went to this great effort to be here, to hear from Him? Philippians chapter 3. Verse, let's start with verse 7. You know this. Paul lays out his resume. Perhaps you know this passage. He's been saying there's a righteousness that comes to us not through works, but through faith. Believing what Christ has already accomplished for us. Not working hard or getting better. This is revolutionary thought. No one had ever taught this before. And so Paul says, I, if anybody's going to put confidence in the flesh, that's another way of saying in what I might do in order to appease God or gain his approval, he says, uh, I, 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 I could put confidence in the flesh more than anybody. I mean, Paul is saying, uh, you want to brag, I, I can brag a lot more. And that's what he does there in, in really verses 4 through 7 to verse 7. He says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. He's encountered Christ, and it's changed everything. Indeed, I count everything as loss, verse 8, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. Some of you know the translation there is really, uh, sorry, dung, rubbish. In order that I may gain Christ, And be found in him. That's all Paul wants is to be found in Christ. In his righteousness. Not having a righteousness of my own. That comes from the law. But that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God. That depends on faith. That I may know him. Look at how much he wants this. I want to know him. And in the power of his resurrection. uh, And may share in his sufferings. He says I'll even share in his sufferings. Bring it on. Becoming like him in his death. Because then I'll become like him through suffering. Even dying to myself. That by all means possible. I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Now the language there in verse 11. Looks like it says. By all means that I may attain it. That I can work towards it. What he's saying is. I want this any way I can get it. I want it more than anything in life. So bring on the suffering. If it means dying to myself, I will die. If it means dying physically for the sake of Christ, I will die. It is now my life. Listen, can you say that about yourself? Is your entire life focused on knowing Christ? Because listen, friends, that is the essence of the Christian life. Many of you have heard me talk about uh, a singular um, uh, writing from Oswald Chambers in his classic book, My Utmost First Highest. I think it's August 4th. It's all marked up in my book where he said the key to the Christian life, one thing. The key to the Christian life is not found in what you do for God. It's not found in what you know about God. Those things are important. But he says it is first found in intimacy with God through Christ, it's intimacy of relationship. Then he says, and then everything else in life comes out of all qualities and characteristics. All that I do in my life comes out of that one relationship. 
That is the pursuit of the believer's life. Intimacy with Christ. And he says, and listen, that's the one thing that will constantly be under attack in your life. And here is the challenge today. Many of us claim to be Christians, and we are not pursuing Christ. Oh, we we might be doing work for Christ. Well, I mean, we show up to church because we like church. And it's a good thing. Got to be in church. And I love being with God's people. I'm coming to church. I'll even get involved. I'm even a teacher. I teach people. I'm going to guide others. I want to be a leader. And we're not personally pursuing Christ in our lives. Let me ask you honestly before God Almighty. Is Christ the singular pursuit when you wake up in the morning? It's the one thing you're pursuing in your life. He is the one thing. Friends, if if not, you are doing the work of God. If you're doing the work of God, seeking to do the work of God in a way that will kill the work of God in you. I'd say it this way. Church makes a terrible hobby. Church is a bad hobby. I mean, go get a boat. Go get a, get a house in the woods. Go, go get, a, get a house in the mountains. Church is a terrible hobby. Because if you're not pursuing Christ and coming together with God's people every single Sunday to love one another well so a watching world says, I want to get in on that and giving our lives to him, we can't wait to be with God's people on Sunday. We can't wait to be in his word every single day. You wake up and I just want to be in his word because my life is all about the pursuit of Christ and him alone. Here's the premise of this message today. If you don't have one thing, your entire life will be distracted by a million things. And you, friend, listen, don't waste your life. I don't want you to waste your life. And God is calling each of us to pursue him and him alone. So here's what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Let's go down to verse 12. Look at what he says. Not that I've already obtained it. Now, look, I'm going to show it to you. Here it is in the NIV. You can see it on the screen there. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal. Now, look at this. As you set goals, and I I challenge you to set goals, make resolutions. He has one. He said, my goal. He doesn't have goals. He's got one goal. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. He's saying, it's already happening. It's, it's going to happen. He who began a good work in me is going to complete it. It's already happened. But he says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing, there's the title of the message. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Really, what what is his goal? Christ. His goal is Christ. So three things I want you to see. If you take notes, I want you to write these down as we walk through them. If applied, this will help you see significant change in your life in 2018. I want to talk about a new year revolution. Paul's going to say three things to us. He's going to talk about we need a holy discontent, we need a singular focus, and we need a dedicated plan. So first, a holy discontent. Verse 12, he says, not that I have already obtained all this. This this is simply his way of saying, listen, I desire more. I'm not there. I can't stay where I am. This is the first and most critical aspect of all that I want to talk about today. See, here's the problem many of us. We don't have a, a holy discontent. And here, here's what I'm talking about, this dissatisfaction, this, this restlessness, a discontent that I want more of Christ. I want more of him. This is why many of us are not pursuing him on a daily basis. It's why he's not the number one singular passion of our lives, because we don't have this holy discontent. Listen, friends, I hope I never get over being saved by Christ. I hope you and I never get over what he's done for us. See, the problem for many of us, myself included, you know, I was, I was saved when I was nine years old. I've had many other grace awakening moments in my life where God's done a new work in me, but I hope I never get over being saved because we can enter into the church 
And we can come to understand it all and learn it. And, and we can just kind of be lulled to sleep and forget who God is and what he's done. We need to rediscover a picture of who God really is. I've said it before. Many of us think, well, he's, he's bigger than I am. Praise God. I need a God that's stronger than me. No, no, no. He's infinitely stronger than you. I'm glad he's smarter than me. No, no, no. He's omniscient. He's infinite in all of his character traits. He's infinitely merciful. He's infinitely just at the same time being infinitely loving. He's God over your life. Nothing comes into your life without first going through his loving hands. He is sovereign over you. He's in control of your life. Do not doubt the fact that he loves you, that he has plans for your life in 2018. And friends, he has saved us. Christ has come to rescue us from our sin. He lived the perfect life for us. Let's never get over the fact that we could not work our way to God, but instead he sent his son and he lived the perfect life. He he was not simply our great example. He was our substitute. And we now can exchange our sin for his righteousness. Let's never get over the fact that he's rescued us from our sin. And we need to pursue him. We don't know him as we should. We're not seeking him as we should. We have sin in our life that we need to confess. But here's the thing, friends. We need an all-out pursuit of Christ. And that'll only come when we, when we realize, I need more of him. I'm desperate for him. How desperate are you for him today? How desperate have you been for him this past week? And how has your schedule, your calendar, your giving, your plans, how have those things reflected your desperation for Christ in your life? I can't create a holy discontent in you. But I would say this. No one would trade a bottle of water for gold if they're out in the desert dying of thirst. And many of us need to come back to Scripture, back to what Christ has done, and say, I'm dying for more. I'm dying for more. And friends, listen, literally, may we die to ourselves in 2018 for more of him. May it be the year that we give our lives to him. May today be the day. J.N. Darby, an English brethren Bible teacher out of the 1800s, I've quoted him before. He says this. He goes to great lengths and makes this point. Necessity finds him out. Meaning that you will, apart from need, you and I don't do anything in our lives. You have some need to be here today. You got here. Today you have a need. You're probably going to be hungry for lunch. You got a need. You're going to go eat lunch. Necessity finds him out. If you don't need him, you don't think you need him, you will not pursue him. And friends, that's just self-sufficient, self-focused life of sin. We're desperate for him. A great challenge in our context. A discontent, a dissatisfaction, a, a, a restlessness is a good thing for those of us who want more of him. So you first need a holy discontent. Secondly, you need a singular focus. Look at this, verse, verse 13. One thing. It must be your own, too, he says. You must own it in the ESV. Verse 8, he, he has said, I count everything as loss because, he says, of the surpassing worth. He knew what it was, the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. It's, it's what, what we need is what Thomas Chalmers, who was a Scottish minister, again, back in the 1800s, he called the explosive power of a new affection. Our problem is this. It's, it's what I've called love out of order. Actually, Augustine referenced this. It's disordered love, misplaced affections. It, we, we need the explosive power of a new affection. Chalmers writes this, the love of God and the love of the world are two affections. Listen to this. Not merely in a state of rivalship, but in a state of enmity and that irreconcilable that they cannot dwell together in the same bosom, in the same heart. The heart is not so constituted, that is made up that way. And the only way to dispossess it of an old affection is by the explosive power of a new one. The reason that resolutions don't work, the reason we say, I need to get over that sin, stop that habit, I need to quit that, is because we do not replace that with a grander, greater affection of a singular focus, 
a superior satisfaction that's found in Christ alone. You say, well, how do I get that? I need more of that. Listen, you need to read his word. You need to be with God's people. You need to be reminded of what he's done for you. All of the Christian life, Martin Luther said, is a life of repentance. And I would add that repentance comes because all of the Christian life is one of remembrance. It's why the great ordinance of the Lord's Supper is a constant remembrance. Remember what he's done. We're prone towards spiritual amnesia. We forget what Christ has done. We don't have this all-out pursuit, this one magnificent obsession, which is Christ the Lord. Is he your obsession? Do people around you know that? Would they say that's true of you? Because of the way you speak, the way you live, the way you love. So what does this look like? Well, I've told you I'm going to show you an Old Testament picture. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you, show you a New Testament picture. Two stories that show us what it looks like. Simply put, it looks like saying no and it looks like saying yes. That's what it is. How do you prioritize your life as you think about the year to come, how you're going to live a new life? It looks a lot like saying no, and it looks a lot like saying yes. That's what Paul's saying here. I'm going to say no to the past. And it's not simply the past. He's saying no to my legalistic religious ways, my self-righteousness, and yes to the gospel of grace and to the righteousness of Christ. So the first story I want you to see is one that's in Nehemiah. And I'll just share this real quick. And then uh, I've got a verse I want you to see that can become something in your mind. I want you to remember. But many of you know the story of Nehemiah. We're going we're gonna to study this story, by the way, beginning later in January in our men's Bible study on Thursday mornings. Great story of leadership and perseverance and devotion. Nehemiah was, of course, uh, a, 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 the cupbearer of the king during the exile. And I won't go into great links here just to save time to make the point simply you know that he went then to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall and he was the leader who came to bring about revival among God's people by building the wall and so he's up on the wall literally up on the wall it seems let's let's say he's on a ladder let's you know he's probably on some kind of uh you know I don't know I don't know what he's on he's on scaffolding he's on an let's put him on a ladder he's working away what happens is, if you know the story, you might remember the name Sanballat. There's, uh, there's Tobiah and Geshem. These are rivals that are coming at him because you can imagine they don't want him to build the wall. And, and so he's building the wall. They come after him and they send for him. They send messengers to say, hey, Nehemiah, come down off the wall. Get off your ladder. We want to talk to you. We need a little conference. Let's do some negotiation here. We just want to talk to you. Well, he'd find out later what he, what he assumed and thought. No, they want to kill him. They want to end this work. And here's what Nehemiah says. Let's come together. Come meet with us. And here's what he says in Nehemiah 6, 3. You can see it there. And I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? Now, here's what I want to put in your head. See, Nehemiah had a job to do. He was obsessed with one thing. Now, for us, again, it's, it's pursuit of Christ, but then all that follows that. He was, he was focused on one thing that allowed him to say no to everything else. It's a key concept. Simply put, it's this. If you do not prioritize your life, someone else will. Now, you can imagine this is a great challenge for me as a pastor. Uh, my life is often saying no to really good things and really good people whom I love. My ministry is really Acts chapter 6, verse 4, prayer and ministry of the Word. If I'm not doing that, then we all suffer. Our entire church uh, suffers as a result. And many of us need to develop the habit of focusing on a singular obsession in our lives, and we need to determine, I will not come down. You're calling for me. I am doing a good work. I'll not come down. Greg McEwen, in a great book called Essentialism, by the way, if you want to learn more about this, he wrote this. You cannot overestimate the unimportance of practically everything. Now, some of us respond to that. We think, no, Jeff, everything matters. Every detail matters. Every, listen, if everything matters, nothing matters. And this is only true. Listen. 
McEwen's statement here is only true if you have a singular priority, a one magnificent obsession. That is very true. If that's the case in your life, everything else takes its place. Nehemiah says, I'm doing a good work. I'm not coming down. Now, here's the challenge for you. What is this for you? What is God calling you to do? Maybe you're already about it. What is he saying? This is the thing that I want you to pursue above all else. Now, maybe, maybe it's a ministry. Again, we're going to get back to Christ as our singular focus. And that's, 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 that's the main thing. But maybe for you, it's not so much what do I need to give up, but what do I need to go big on? What is he calling me to do? How has he gifted me? What are you on your ladder doing? Or what is he calling you to do? Because you see, for many of us here, I'd say to some of our parents, in this season of your life, maybe you have young children. And, 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 and you're you thinking, you know, no, no, I, I could commit to that. I could join that group. I got to work out more. I, gotta, I need to make more money. Listen, no, no, no. What you need to do is say, no, 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 listen, I'm doing a good work. I cannot come down. Many of you dads, listen, you need to decide. You're going to spend more time with your family in 2018. And it means on a daily basis. No, no, no. I'm doing a good work. I will not come down. And some of you are devoted. Maybe now you're taking care of a family member. You say, I will not come down. Some of you are committed to a spouse or maybe to an elderly parent. I'm serving them. I will not come down. Some of you need to devote your time to your marriage. And you're going to focus and love your spouse. It might even mean being committed to counseling and help. I will not come down. I'm not going to quit. Some of you need to finish something that you started. I'm going to finish that degree in 2018. I will not come down. Those are good things. I'm not coming down. Some of you need to pay off debt in your life. You're strapped with debt. I will not come down. I'm giving up that, that, and that because I'm not coming down. Some of you need to devote your life to prayer. What is it for you? I'm not going to do that. That's my time in prayer. I will not come down. I'm going to be in the Word of God. I'm committing to read the Bible through perhaps this year. I will not come down. You see how this works? Saying yes to something means that you're saying no to other things. What is that for you? Maybe you're discipling someone. I'm investing my life in that person. I will not come down. I've got a group of people that I'm devoted to. I'm going to continue to pour my life into them. I'm not coming down. What is that for you? Write it down talk about it. So you need a holy discontent. You need a singular focus. Finally, you need a dedicated plan. Paul's one thing, look at this. I'm always intrigued by this. His one thing involves two things. (laughs) Because you can't move into a preferred future without leaving the past behind. You can't do it. You can't sit here today and say, 2018 is going to be different. My future is going to look different. I'm not going to change a thing, but the future is going to look different. No, it's not. It means that you're going to begin today to say, I'm going to change what I'm doing in the present. I'll leave behind these things that have captured my attention. What was Paul's goal? Again, his ultimate goal was Christ himself. Christ himself. In order to pursue Christ, you've got to leave behind other things. Following Christ involves repentance and pursuit. Listen, repentance and pursuit. Simply put, love God, hate sin. Love God, hate sin. Psalm 97 verse 10 says, Oh, you who love the Lord, hate evil. He preserves the lives of his saints. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Here's the thing about resolutions. Let me talk about this for a moment. Some of you, and I challenge you, you know, stop eating so much. Stop, stop spending so much money. Uh, give more. Stop drinking so much. Whatever it is. But name sin in your life. Start there. Repentance begins when you name a particular sin. Because if you're going to move forward in 2018, many of us need to decide, that is sin in my life. And I'm going to combat it. I'm going to fight it. I'm going to overcome it. But here's how this works. Listen, central to the message here today is this. Many, let me speak to, to overcoming sin because that should be resolution 
should be the personal revolution of your life. Revolt against sin. Hate sin in your life. Don't simply enter into some kind of sin management because here's what we do. We think, uh, uh, Jeff, you're right. I got sin in my life. And I want you to think about the particular sin in your life. So I'm going I'm to overcome it. I, I'm going to work harder. I'm going to get better. I'm going to read more about it. I need, I need to be accountable is what it is. I need friends to be all that's good. I need to read scripture. I'm going to memorize scripture. I got to work harder. I'm going to work harder to overcome this sin. Let me ask you, how's that working out for you? How's that going? Because what we do, we enter into, learn this, listen, moralism says that we can get better by keeping rules and striving to be good. Scripture rejects that idea. The Bible says instead that, 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 that character development really takes place in the context of freedom. Listen, change comes not from striving on your own, to be like Jesus. It comes by developing a habit of being and communing with Jesus. Did you catch that? The Christian life is not simply trying to be like Jesus. I say it often, good luck with that. What would Jesus do? Whatever he would do, he'll do it perfectly. Have at it. Because, see, our motivations even are skewed because of our sin. Change comes when we enter into communion with him, not simply trying to be like him. And then watch this. Then suddenly we start to become like him because we're spending time. You see how important this is. A singular focus, moralism causes, causes uh, us to change or we seek change from the, from the outside in. Okay, through cosmetic, behavior-focused sin management. Grace produces change from the inside out through heart renewal and a change in a, a transformed motivation. We desire, you see, necessity finds him out. When we commune with him, we know who he is. We see him for who he is in our God-desiring nature over and up against our legalistic sin and law-desiring nature. That's what Paul is talking about here. I'm leaving that behind. I'm going to pursue Christ. It all begins by pursuing him. Now, I'm going to close with the, with the, with the New Testament picture because I don't know what this looks like for you exactly. But I do know where it all begins for every single one of us in here. It begins with time alone, in solitude, daily before our King. Does that mark your life? Are you living out of an overflow of being with Jesus? He said abiding in Him. Because you can't bear fruit apart from the vine. And so the picture, though, I want you to see is in Luke chapter 10, uh, and it's verses 38 through 42. Now, I'll just share this story briefly, and then we'll close. You know the story, perhaps. This is the story of Martha, who's distracted by many things, right? Um, and and, and she, she, by the way, she's distracted by much serving. She's doing good things. This is the good up against the best. This is a great story. To, to, to teach us this. Mary's chosen a good portion, which will not be taken away from her. And, and so what happens is Jesus says, listen, Martha, Martha. And I have this, this sense of great compassion in his voice. He says, you are worried and anxious about many things. Because he's cry, you know, called out, why aren't you telling her, your, your sister, my sister, to help me? And we do this a lot, right? Jesus, would you speak to him about this? Would you speak to my spouse? Some of us are doing it here. This is a great sermon. I hope he's hearing this. <laughs> right? I know who this is for. I'm going to get this. Well, now you can't. I'm going to get this sermon. I'm going to send it to a friend. I'm going to tag it. They're gonna let, I want you to listen. Would you tell Mary to help me? And then Jesus says, Martha, no, 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 no. Watch this. Mary, who's sitting at my feet, listening to my voice, communing with me, she's chosen the best thing. Because he goes on to say, listen, only one thing. There's the sermon title. One thing necessary. She's chosen the best thing. What is that? Communion with me. It means, friends, daily. You should spend time in the Word before the Lord. Time with Jesus. 
We'd love to help you with that if you need some guidance towards that. Open the book of John and read it. Just spend time with him. Write down your prayers. Journal your thoughts if that'll help you. Another application of this is this. When the word is being taught, everything else is secondary. When God's people gather like we have this morning, we'll gather again next Sunday, everything else is secondary. When God's word is being taught in your Bible study group, you're there. When God's word is being taught in your connect group, you're in it. And some of you aren't even in a connect group. Doing life with other believers, applying his word, committed to being in his word, that's priority number one. That's what that looks like. A daily devotion to him. And so here's my challenge as we close. You need to dive in deep. Be be passionate and pursue the Lord with all you've got. And we do this together, friends. It's why many of you need to join the fellowship of the church. You see, if if my dad were here, I remember him saying on this day often, he'd say, hey, he'd say it today. If you want to get it done, 2017, you better get after it. You're running out of time. If you had, if you had, if it was a goal for you, you better get on it. Friends, listen, don't wait to 2018. Now, as we close our service, decide that you're going to pursue Christ with everything you have. And some of you, you need to join the fellowship of our church today. What are you waiting on? One pursuit, Christ, and we do it together. Choose him, choose his church. Some of you need to be baptized. Commit to him. What are you waiting on? Don't wait another day. One thing, a new year revolution, and I challenge you to this specific task. I want you to write down one word. Think about it over the next few days. One word that'll be your pursuit, your focus this coming year. We do this as a staff every year. I have a bookmark in my Bible. It has these theme words for all of our ministers on staff so I can pray for them as we each have decided a singular word that will be our focus for the coming year. Do that. Bring it to one thing, but let the one thing always be above, and, uh, above everything else. Let it be Christ and Him alone. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.